things in the blue shirt. Eric will be drumming today. George will be playing the piano. And Josh will be playing the bass. Doug's in charge. So Doug has made a lot of wonderful equipment, and we're going to get to hear a lot of it today. So take it away. Doug. Okay. Enjoy yourself. Great. Thank you, John. And thank you, everybody, for coming here tonight. Really appreciate it. It's great to see so many old friends and some new people that I just met this time, including John and, and his guys who have been just terrific helping us to set this up. Because as you can imagine, doing a project like this with very limited miking in a room we've never been in before, a fabulous room, but one that we really had to understand a little bit, um, uh, they've just been the greatest in helping us to everything we needed to, to make this project work. So the title for this is Classic Recording Techniques for a High Resolution Future. And that sort of encapsulates the concept that, you know, we're always looking, the, the, the three of us in particular, are always looking for a better sound, a better capture of of the, of the music that we're dealing with. And, you know, if you don't learn something in every session you do, you know, something's wrong. So we like taking a lot of chances and experimenting and seeing, does this work? And a lot of times we'll say something, that sounds really good. And then, you know, it could be the next day or it could be six years later, we say, you know what? That really doesn't sound as good as it should. <laughs> and we experiment and we find other ways of doing it. So that's what we want to share with you tonight. And I should point out before I forget that we have a couple of microphones here, like this one in front of me and this one in back of me, which are not part of the recording. <coughs> These are strictly to record the, the talk. Um, we're using two mics, which I'm going to talk about more in a little bit. So. And I'd also like to thank uh, Owen Curtin, who set this all up for me. Um, here's basically what we're going to do tonight. I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about the technical aspects of what we're doing and why, including some history. And I don't know how much you're interested in history. When I've done this talk before, sometimes I've gone into a lot of history, and it really drags the thing out. So I've cut out a lot of that. But it's really fascinating to see the prog progression from one thing to another and how everything built on each other to where we are today. But that's going to have to be a talk for another time. So I'm going to talk about the technical aspects of it. Then Joff and George will be up here and they'll talk about it from a musician's point of view because you know they're the ones that are trying that we're all trying to capture their sound as best we can. And, you know, they have a little bit different perspective than I do. And between the three of us, you know, we, we're pretty much in agreement on everything, but um, three different perspectives. And it's really helpful when we get together and talk and listen and evaluate what we're doing. So they're going to talk a little bit about that. And then we're going to record two short pieces with piano, upright bass, and drums uh, with two microphones. And then we'll, we're recording it on equipment that's in here, and then we'll go back to the control room. And I don't know if everybody will fit in there at the same time. We might have to do it in a couple shifts. So that's a pretty big room. Yeah. Um, and listen to it. And at that point, we can discuss it, get your feedback, answer your questions, or whatever, because we're interested in, in your reaction to it as well. So that's the plan. So, starting out with the um, classic recording techniques end of the presentation, I think it's important to realize that at the dawn of recording in the late 1800s, the recording was done with a single point pickup because that's the only way it could be done. There's a big horn that captured the sound in the room and you know, if you want to know the technical details of it, it funneled that sound down to a diaphragm, to a stylus, which engraved the waveform onto some medium, which changed over the years. But basically, that process, you know, still exists in vinyl records today. 
But the key thing was, from our point of view, is that it was a single point pickup. They had no option to do anything else. So how did they do that? I mean, if you listen to those recordings, technically, you know, they're pretty crude. They're noisy, limited dynamic range, frequency response is terrible, and it's loaded with distortion. And yet, they captured the music pretty well. Um, so how did they do that with just one, essentially one microphone? They did it by finding good acoustic spaces that were, you know, appropriate for what they were recording and then moving the performers around to achieve the balance that they wanted. So if they're recording a pop thing, uh, you know, with a vocalist, and you couldn't hear the vocalist over a band, move the vocalist closer to the microphone. If the uh, trumpets were just overpowering, put them in the back. And it resulted in some very strange looking session pictures, the way it was set up. But they achieved the balance they wanted that way. Now, it's interesting to me that even after what they called electrical recording, which meant using microphones and amplifiers to, to capture the sound, which came about in the mid-1920s, <laughs> that they still just used one microphone. And it wasn't long after that that they had the capability to mix multiple microphones, but they didn't do it. In fact, for the first 65 years of recorded music, there was only one microphone. You know, even for broadcast, where they might use lots of microphones, there was only one on at a time, you know? If they had two performers, they put them on either side of a bi-directional mic. Or if it was more, they might put them all around an omnidirectional mic. But if the performers were here on the stage and the band was over there, when it came time for the band to play, they'd kill the announcer's microphone and just use the microphone on the band. So, that's the way it was done, even long after it became practical to mix multiple microphones together. And <clears throat> there's some advantages to that. It's challenging because you got to get it right there. You can't change it later. You, what you get is what you've got. Um, but you had zero phase and time differences between the sound being picked up by multiple microphones, which is a really key thing to getting a solid image of the sound, even in mono. Um, stereo is a little more forgiving of some of those phase <coughs> errors, but still, um, you know, for me, I'm forever switching the monitors into mono just to see what happens, because that to me reveals a lot of the problems that need to be addressed then and there with the miking and the setup. So one microphone eliminates that. There can be no phase errors that way. So the microphones we're using tonight are ribbon microphones. Now, ribbon microphones were the first high quality microphones developed. You know, they, 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 they experimented with condenser microphones. Bell Labs invented that in the 20s. And, uh, you know, dynamic microphones of other types. I mean, a ribbon is a dynamic microphone, and technically. Um, but it wasn't practical to make ribbon microphones back in those days because, believe it or not, until around 1930, there were no powerful permanent magnets. They just didn't exist. And it wasn't until, Cliff, you can correct me if I'm wrong, the invention of Alnico. Was that the first? Yeah. First powerful permanent magnet that could be used both in loudspeakers and in microphones and other applications too, of course. But uh, for the ribbon microphone, it relied on a very powerful magnetic field. And the earliest microphone, ribbon microphone experiments, both in the United States and in Germany, were done with electromagnets because they had no permanent magnets. Big coils of wire with DC running through it to, to form a magnetic field in that um, thing to, to make a, a, a magnetic field for the ribbon. So during the 1920s, especially the late 1920s, you had EMI in England, Siemens in Germany, and RCA here in the United States desperately trying to come up with a ribbon microphone because the concept of it was so elegant and everybody realized this could make a really superb microphone. Well, RCA was the first one to really make it work. And um, 
Harry Olson, who had the patent on the ribbon microphone in 1930, developed that all in our neighborhood in Camden, New Jersey. We're from Philadelphia area. And he was alive until, oh, I guess maybe 15 or 20 years ago. And I have copies of all his notebooks for the development of the 44 and other things he was working on too. But it's just fascinating to go through that and look and see what they tried, what didn't work, what they did to correct that. And to me, a key thing that he did was he not only measured his microphones in an anechoic chamber, probably one of the first in the world in Camden, New Jersey, but he also took the microphone prototypes and recorded actual sounds with them. And he recorded speech like an announcer and he recorded music with it. So his um, guidance for developing that 44 microphone was based not only on the physics of it and all the science, but also on how it sounded, which I think is something that we're, we've really lost today in so much of the audio gear. So the ribbon microphone is very simple in concept. All you need to do to generate a voltage is have a conductor that moves through a magnetic field. That's how the power for these lights in here is generated, you know? That's how dynamic microphones work. That's how loudspeakers work in reverse. And so the concept is very simple. In the case of a ribbon microphone, you're just moving a thin sheet of aluminum foil, very thin, thinner than your household aluminum foil, suspended in an intense magnetic field. And part of the challenge of designing a microphone is designing the pole pieces to focus that magnetic field properly. And I learned that a lot working with, with Cliff Hendrickson here, who's a developer of, a, of the RM1 ribbon microphone, which is you know, a really excellent ribbon mic. So that's the easy part. I bet you you could go home and scrounge together enough stuff to make a ribbon mic that would actually generate some voltage and you could maybe sort of understand if you spoke into it, you know. But getting it to be a hi-fi device is much more complicated. That's where the details come in. And uh, the 44 is still one of the best sounding microphones ever made. It's really spectacular just how good that design was. For, for being the first really practical ribbon microphone ever, it still holds up today. It was in production for 50 years, um, and it probably would still be in production today if RCA still existed. But fortunately for us, there are people out there that had a love of, mi of uh, ribbon microphones and decided to keep these things alive. And one of those people is Wes Dooley. Now Wes is the founder of Audio Engineering Associates in Pasadena, California. He got his start working on a wide range of uh, pro audio things. But one of the things he did was refurbish all these old ribbon microphones for Hollywood studios because they use a lot of ribbon mics for on sound stages and so on. And so he got he did that for many years and got quite a reputation of being the expert on fixing these old ribbon microphones. And at some point along the way, Wes decided, well, I could you know, there's no more of these being made, I could make some. And he started making his own replicas of the original RCA 44. Now he has three or four or five different variations of that out, which are all really good. But then he thought that well, maybe he could develop some original designs based on what he had learned on that from that. And he did, and he has a line of, uh, of various um, original design ribbon mics, which probably a lot of you are familiar with. The R84, I guess, is the most uh, most commonly known one. The thing about ribbon microphones is that they're natively bidirectional, which means that they're sensitive to sound on either side of the ribbon element equally. And it should be, if they're designed properly, should be identical response on both sides of it. Now you could look at that as a feature or you could look at that as a bug. For me, I see it almost entirely as a feature. And the reason being 
is that when you're 90 degrees off, when, you're, when the sound source is in the same plane as the ribbon, it has zero response to the sound because the sound is hitting that ribbon equal intensity on both sides, it can't move. So the null on the side of a ribbon microphone is far deeper than any cardioid microphone, any shotgun microphone. It's just astoundingly deep. And even microphones that I have that are condenser microphones, if they have a bi-directional pattern on them, they're almost always on that bi-directional pattern. And if you're doing a session where you do need to use multiple microphones, because let's face it, there's times when you, you can't do all this wonderful stuff we're doing here tonight, um, you can often get far greater isolation by the setup of your performers and the microphones by putting whatever's going to be a problem sound into the null of that microphone. It'll just disappear, you know. And you can even use that if you want to pick up room sound. You, you set the microphone so that the null of the microphone is towards the sound source, so you eliminate most of the direct sound, and all you have is the room. It's really pretty wonderful technique. But then we come to Alan Bloomline. Alan Bloomline was an engineer for EMI in England, and he worked for many years at Abbey Road in England. And he had this obsession with the concept of stereo recording. He's a brilliant guy. I mean, he, he did so many things that were well beyond audio. In fact, sadly, he was killed at age 39 when he was helping EMI develop airborne radar systems for the British military during World War II, and the plane he was in crashed. Um, who knows what he might have done, you know, post-war after that, because he was still a young man. So, Alan Blumlein's concept of stereo wasn't just, oh, we'll just put up two mics, because that had been done before. That had been done in the 1890s, uh, with telephone microphones on a stage, and it was a subscription service. You could, you could actually pay to subscribe to this and listen to concerts at home with two telephone headsets in your ears. It was stereo. People were amazed. And even that crummy circuit, you know, through carbon button microphones and through telephone lines to a crummy little headphone thing, was still astounding to people that how good it sounded in stereo. But Alan wanted to do a system that was from the production of the music to the listening environment. And he developed this whole chain of every piece all the way through. Now, a lot of it was totally theoretical because the technology didn't exist to do it. There was no practical way, for example, to record stereo back then. You know, but he came up with um, the 45 degree cutter head for cutting stereo, which I don't think ever went beyond his prototype stages until Westrex or whoever, Neumann, whoever was the first one to actually develop that, I'm not sure. That's still what they use today for cutting stereo discs. That was his invention. So he had this concept all the way through the chain. And for the microphone, he recognized that you had to minimize the phase difference between the two um, left and right microphones in order to prevent all that um, phase cancellation and, and things that degrade the sound. So he developed a system where he took two ribbon mics and in his actual patent for this, it's very interesting, the two ribbons are in the same magnetic field right next to each other. I don't know whether that's really practical. I've been trying for decades to get a ribbon microphone manufacturer to try that and see if it really works or not, but I can't convince anybody to do it. But the way Bloomline was actually um, implemented in reality was to use two ribbon microphones that were just rotated 90 degrees to each other. And this formed a really interesting pattern because you had essentially an omnidirectional stereo microphone. And it has some really interesting characteristics. Some of them are not entirely um, intuitive right off the bat. One is that the stereo image is reversed on the back of the microphone. So you have to take that into account. 
I once recorded a concert uh, with just a single Bloomline mic <coughs> hung in the auditorium. Um, and I didn't realize until the rehearsal that the choir was going to process in down the center aisle and then go on the stage while they're singing. And it was really interesting because if you focused on one voice in the choir, you could hear them as they came closer and closer, and then suddenly they were on the other side. So, <laughs> yeah. A little disconcerting. I don't think most people notice that, you know, but engineers, you know, pick up those details. So it was, that's one thing you have to be careful of. But it's really not a major problem in most situations. So probably in the early 70s, or maybe even late 60s, I read about this Bloomline technique for stereo recording. And it wasn't even something that was being used in studios. It was just in textbooks and stuff. And I said, that's a really neat idea. I have to try that. And I tried it with two 44s which isn't easy to do because those powerful magnets will just bang them into each other. You really had to be careful how you mounted them because they'd always want to clamp together and when they did that, they'd rattle together and make noise you couldn't utilize. But um, if you can manage to get them to, from touching, it was really a really good sound. And even with multi-pattern condenser microphones, you can do the same thing. And since that day, I'd say 95% of the stereo recording I've done is being done that way, with that bloom line configuration. You know, I've tried X, Y, and sometimes you have to use it just because you can't have any response off the back. I don't particularly like it, but it solves the problem. I've tried MS, which other people make sound great, but you know, for me, it's just not me. I just don't like the way it sounds. I tried the Deca Tree. And you know, they, that sounds great in Hollywood scores and stuff and your orchestral recording, but again, it's not me. And for me, that bloom line just like is a sweet spot for a stereo pickup. It just sounds to my ears just right. And another interesting um, <clears throat> characteristic of ribbon microphones in general is that in my experience, where you place that microphone sounds audibly on the recording like the microphone's half the distance that it actually is. If you put a condenser mic there and recorded it and a ribbon mic in the same position and recorded it, it, the ribbon mic would always have more presence. It would just feel like you were somehow drawn into the sound of it better. And when you do that in bloom line with a stereo, it's even more compelling. So, I'm not saying any of those other techniques aren't valid, and it's, people make them sound great, but I just really like that, and these guys do too. So what we're using tonight for microphones are made by AEA, West Dooley's company, and they are it's called an R88. And this microphone has an interesting history because Wes used to send me prototypes or early production versions of, of his mics for me to play with. And one time he sent me a pair of R84s when they first came out. And I liked that microphone a lot. I didn't like it as well as a 44, but it did was a little lighter and easier to deal with. But the sound-wise, I wasn't totally thrilled with it. But I said to Wes, this is a really nice sounding mic. Um, have you ever thought about doing a stereo version of it? And he says, yep, I'm working on that. And that became the R88. Now, it isn't two R84s, though. It's a completely different microphone. Because as he was working on it, and I kept telling him how much I liked the 44, and I don't know how much influence I had on him, um, but he eventually, essentially made a 44-style ribbon as the elements in the R88. So it's a long ribbon, it's a two-inch ribbon. And um, the other thing that he did, which I think was genius, was he eliminated all of the protection to the ribbon. You know, most ribbon mics have quite a bit of pop filtering and stuff in them just to prevent damage. And they advertise the R88 as a far field mic, mainly because I don't think they want to see the mics coming back from a vocalist <laughs> blowing them out, because there's no protection to that ribbon. That makes them very vulnerable. You can ruin the ribbon, in it, which isn't disastrous, it just has to be replaced. 
But you can ruin the ribbon in that microphone just by swinging it too fast on a boom stand. You know, you really have to move it slowly. You can ruin the ribbon by putting it in a case and closing the lid too quickly. So there's no protection of the ribbon, which means it's vulnerable. But on the other hand, there's nothing between you, your sound, and the ribbon itself. And that makes a huge difference. So the R88 is permanently configured in the Blum line 90 degree configuration. And that's what it's meant to do. Although I have occasionally used just one section of it when that kind of sound I wanted, but didn't need it to be in stereo. From those two microphones, we're going into um, the DW Firm VT24 mic preamp. This is um, basically the same, well, it's not basically, it's identical to the original microphone preamp I designed about 25 years ago. The first version was a VT1, which is a single channel version. And then we came out with a two channel version, VT2. And then this one for people who wanted more channels, but you know, everybody has limited rack space. So this solved the problem of getting four channels in, in a smaller space. So we're using that. And from there, we're going into two Tascam DA3000 DSD recorders. The Tascam DA3000 is an interesting recorder, which I have to give credit to Joff and George for discovering, because I think they got talking to somebody at AES from Tascam, and they gave them a couple of them to experiment with, and they were really pleased with the sound they were getting. It was just better than anything they had done, used before. So um, now we have a bunch of them, so we can we can actually do multi-track stuff with them. So. Those are the recorders we're using. They're capable of doing PCM recording, which is a standard kind of Pro Tools, everything else recording. Um, but they also are capable of DSD recording. Now DSD stands for Direct Stream Digital. And it's an entirely different mathematical approach to digitally capturing sound. And we feel it sounds better than PCM. And the difference isn't dramatic. It isn't the kind of thing you just say, wow, that sounds so much better, because let's face it, PCM 24-bit sounds pretty good. But we think the, the, the DSD recordings sound better. Uh, if you want to learn more about it, just go online and look it up, and you'll find lots of technical information on it, some of it contradictory. Um, this was, this format actually goes back to the 1950s. So it's not like a new invention. Just like um, Bell Laboratories invented digital audio in the 1930s, you know, it's not, none of this stuff is brand new. But the current audio version of DSD recording was developed for the SACD, which is an audio file disc format. And it's sometimes called one-bit recording, and it uses an entirely different principle. For one thing, it uses a much higher sample rate, rather than the 96 or 192 or whatever sample rate that we're used to at PCM. The SACD sample rate is 2.8 megahertz, megahertz. Now, the sample rate we're using tonight with these recorders is uh, 5.6 megahertz which I think has become pretty much the standard now for professional DSD recording. Uh, there's also 11.2 and 22.5 megahertz that are, that are available. We, we haven't really had much exposure to that yet, but personally, I don't think it's gonna make a whole lot of difference, but I'm willing to, to listen and see. But DSD is not without its problems, and some of them are pretty major. Um, Probably the biggest disadvantage of DSD is at this point, there's no practical way to mix it in the digital domain. Um, Sony had a system that was sort of allowed you to do some digital manipulation in their Sonoma system. But still to this day, if you have multi-tracks of DSD, you either have to convert it to PCM or you have to mix it analog. And that's what we're doing tonight, is mixing it analog. And that's, that seems to be fine. 
Even converting to PCM seems to be fine because like so many things in audio, the further down the chain you have a problem, the less important it becomes. You know? So for us using the VT24 um, microphone preamplifier captures the sound in a way that we just have never heard with a solid state mic preamp. And some of you have been some of my other talks in Boston heard me talk about that. Um, so I'm not gonna go into that tonight. But another problem with any kind of digital sampling is the anti-aliasing filters. And you know, for the 44.1 sample rate of a CD, uh, you know, according to the Nyquist theorem, Nyquist, by the way, worked for Bell Labs, developed their digital system for the telephone system in the 1920s. Um, his theorem states that you cannot reproduce anything more than um, half the sample rate. Now think about that. If you have, say, a, a 10 kilohertz um, sound, could be a sine wave or a component of the, of the sound. And you were sampling that at the lowest possible Nyquist rate, which would be 20 kilohertz. It's only defined by two points. If it's a sine wave, it's no longer a sine wave. It's some bizarre form of waveform that is not a sine. Well, keep that going. 44.1 cuts off at around 20 kilohertz. There's still lots of important data between 10 and 20 kilohertz, you don't have a reproduction of that. You just have a, a rough facsimile of those waveforms above that. Well, what does that do? I mean, what is all that information up there? It's all the transient data. It's all the things that make things sound real and clear. And you've thrown that all away. Now, when you get up to 48, it gets a little better, but not much. 96, you start to eliminate some of those problems because you no longer have to filter it so far down. So the sample rate will allow you to have more accurate representations. But um, it, at any sample rate, at the higher audio frequencies, it's never an exact duplicate of the waveform. So is that important? You know, I mean, lots of things go on in that realm of audio that we believe are audible. They're not audible because you sit there and listen and analytically tell that something's happening. But it has to do with how, you, how that music makes you feel, the impact of that music, and the realism of that music. And there's another factor involved here too, because in any kind of digital recording, and PCM is much worse at this than DSD, um, there's lots of weird artifacts going on all the time. And careful algorithms and careful filtering minimizes those. But I'm sure some of you are aware of this, but if you're not, I'm going to ruin your life because I'm going to tell you, once you become aware of those artifacts in digital recording, you can never unhear them. <laughs> you know, they'll always annoy you. You know, and unfortunately, those artifacts are not musically related to what's going on. They they're mathematically predictable, but to our ears, they're just totally random. And sure, you don't really notice them that much. It sounds pretty good, but what is that actually doing to you? You know, and we were talking about this on the way up here that if you did two, two full day sessions back to back, you did one of them with a PCM style recording, whatever, high, high resolution. Next day you did one with DSD. We don't know the answer to this, but our feeling is after the PCM day of recording, you'd be beat, tired, and sick of hearing stuff. On the other hand, we think with, with DSD recording, you might go home and say, I want to hear that again, you know, after a long day of recording. For us, I think these guys would agree, we, we can listen to the stuff we do DSD over and over and over again, and it's like we never get tired of it. And I can't say that about PCM recording. 
So, and of course, there's another aspect to them in PCM recording. It was with those anti-aliasing filters, which by nature have to be pretty sharp cutoffs, especially at, at uh, the lower sample rates. No matter how well designed those filters are, they have phase shift in them, which changes your perception of the music, smears the transients, and um, it doesn't sound natural because even though most of us in this room probably can't hear much over 10K anymore, judging from the age of most people here and the abuse most young people have done to their hearing, <laughs> I doubt if anybody in here can hear over 10K. But you know, that's okay. Because if you go to a concert, whether it's a rock concert or a classical concert, if you're sitting out in the audience, you're not hearing anything above 10K. The reason being is all that has been absorbed by the air before it got to you. So it does not exist in that sound. That's one of the reasons why, if you've ever played in an orchestra, you'll know the strings sound awful when you're sitting up there. <laughs> you know, by the time you get you know, 50 or 100 feet away, they start sounding pretty good because you've filtered out all that stuff. Um, so our hearing is actually, uh, has, has adjusted itself to hear that kind of a gradual roll off. And it depends on the temperature and humidity and atmospheric pressure and so on. But for the most part, it's only a couple dB per octave kind of roll off. And that, uh, our ear sounds natural. And when you go to a certain point and cut it off abruptly like that, it just doesn't sound right. And Rupert Neve used to make the argument, said, listen to a 20 kilohertz sine wave. We were all much younger then. We can probably even actually hear that. And he says, now listen to a 20 kilohertz square wave. And, you know, square wave is the fundamental plus all the out order harmonics. And they sound different. He says, why do they sound different? If you can't hear above 20 kilohertz, you should not be able to hear that first component overtone of the square wave, which would be 40 kilohertz. You shouldn't be able to hear it. So why does it sound different? You know. So I think there's much more to it that we hear things in that supersonic realm that we don't perceive as sound, but they have an effect on how we respond to the music. So even though in the real world they're rolled off, they're not gone, because that roll off is pretty gradual. They're still there. Okay, getting back to the disadvantage of uh, DSD. Potentially has a pretty lousy noise floor. You know, we're used to this 100 dB or better noise floor these days. I go back to the days of tape when you got 65 dB, you were doing great. You know, really well aligned machine with some good reel of tape you get 65 dB. It's luxurious to work with the 100 dB noise floor. Um, but DSD cannot have as low a noise floor as 24-bit PCM. It's not much worse, and I would say it probably doesn't matter, because when you get down that low, what is your greatest source of noise? Because the electronics these days is pretty darn quiet. Um, the greatest source of noise is your room. You know, no matter what's going on in here, you turn up a mic in here with nobody in the room, you're gonna see stuff because there's rumble from the trucks and the traffic and the train going by. I don't, I don't know if that's how isolated you are, but I, you know, it's probably pretty good, but it's not, it's never 100%. And uh, so that sort of sets your noise floor in my mind. Okay, so basically, to sum this up, this part of the talk, we use old, but often what we consider superior ways of recording. You know, we're using ribbon mics, which were considered totally obsolete by, what, 1970. You know, they've had a resurgence recently, which is great, but for the most part, they were just delegated to, you know, the junk drawer in the studio, or thrown away, can't believe it. Um, we're using vacuum tubes entirely in this chain, except for the solid state analog stages in the recorders. And um, that's the way we think that we capture the sound the best. Uh, 
DSD is an emerging technology, but you know, it could be so much better. It just needs somebody to put some money behind it. And of course, um, you still have to mix a thing in analog or something, which has its drawbacks, but you know, not really that much because we found that when you capture something in the DSD format, it can take a lot of torture down the road and still maintain a whole lot of its integrity. So like everything else, you know, capture it right and then you've got something to work with later. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Joff and George and they're going to talk a bit about the, uh, their viewpoint of this from a musician, performer, and recording engineering side of it. Okay, so I uh, should probably start by giving you guys a little bit of background on us. Uh, we've been, we were brought up as classical musicians. Uh, rebelled against our parents and became jazz musicians. Uh, went to college for that. I <clears throat> was asked politely to leave high school by the principal and spent what would have been my senior year at a, uh, an audio engineering school in, in Manhattan, which is not there anymore, so don't look for it. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, and from there on, we started producing records. Uh, uh, really on a lot of garbage gear. Um, uh, when the ADAT came out, we thought that was fantastic. Well, uh, you know how that turned out. Uh, so we, we dubbed this term guerrilla producers because we're sort of in the jungle with no budget and nobody cares about us and we're having to make recordings that will compete against, you know, Marcus Miller, who's got a $150,000 budget and a, and a euphonics console in his living room. Um, <clears throat> and so we just had to spend our time doing the best we could with what we had. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, uh, being a keyboard player, I was into all these vintage uh, instruments, which are just a complete disaster, and Wurlitzers and Rhodes, and, and then the synthesizer stuff. and. Uh, and uh, there's nobody to fix that stuff, and it breaks constantly. And, uh, and Joff started poking around online and said, oh, I, I think I can fix it. I said, really, you think so? He says, well, the electronics repair guys do it. How hard can it be? <laughs> uh, so uh, it went from there to, I should let you tell the story, actually. Uh, well, one from there, I should just add that along with this guerrilla producing that we're doing, making recordings on total garbage gear. Any money that we made, we always turned it over into more gear, bartered for better gear, whatever we could do to sort of up our game. Uh, and then along with the vintage electronic stuff, so I got into fixing some of that stuff and you start to look at, you know, preamps and mics and these other things and it's like, well, if I can sort of fix this stuff, maybe we can build some better stuff and, uh, and up our game. Actually, I think at one point we took all of our sort of commercially produced equipment and sold it and put all of that money into more DIY equipment and up that, which for me uh, was a tremendous education because I learned all this great stuff before going to work for Doug to build these things, um, which, you know, you, this is the top of the game. This is it. This is the pinnacle for us. So that it's nice to be not chasing that part anymore. Yeah, there's no trading up from, from there. Right. <laughs> uh, where are we headed with this? Uh, right, so you started working for Doug. Uh, you borrowed my RD8. Borrowed your RD8. Uh, we, uh, okay, you know, actually, one of the biggest things that happened to us along the way, and this is what, five, six years ago, uh, is something that I think is underemphasized uh, with younger engineers, and that is what are you listening to? And we had gone through 
monitor speakers from at least this monitor ones, you know, those sort of blue gray monster things that are, you know, good at holding doors open or whatever, uh, into a couple other steps from there. And we finally got to sort of an intermediate step. And I was leaving the studio with a headache every day. Every day I was leaving the studio with a headache. And finally it's like, we, we need to start looking for some better thing. And uh, a producer friend of ours was moving his studio from New York City down to South Jersey. And he called me and said, hey, I'm going to have my assistant drop some gear off to you, you know, t test it for me. Tell me, what, tell me what you think. I said, all right. And he pulls up with a minivan and, and fills my dining room, half floor to ceiling, with a bunch of boxes and stuff. I'm like, okay. And he came over the next morning, and I'm thinking, what the hell are we going to do with this? I, we don't we're working. We don't have time to deal with this. What do these speakers sound like? And well, they were PMC 226s. I don't know who's from familiar with these things, but we plugged them in, and 15 seconds later, I thought, this is going to be the biggest check we write all year. <laughs> um, and uh, we still have them. And in fact, ours are so early, I think they even had a proper serial number. I mean, we, we had a problem with one of the amps and sent it back, and these guys were like, where did you get these? I'm like, well, I got them from you. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, we spent weeks with producer friends sitting around and doing uh, converter shootouts and listening to all kinds of records and stuff and saying, oh, look, this is how they botched the mastering job on this. This is what over compression sounds like. I mean, in every case, it was just phenomenal that we could dial into that. And then we lost our tolerance for using any other preamps other than these, which was pretty funny because we had VT2 for a couple years and we had you know the regular yeah i mean actually stuff. you know he was building api clones and we had a bunch of those and we had some sort of need related stuff, things yeah. and 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 uh and with those monitors it became clear we can't we can't deal with any of this stuff anymore and we sold everything and got two of these uh and have really never looked back and uh and don't use any other preamps save for one, which is uh, one that we build ourselves that you know, we, we licensed design from Doug. Um, and it's sort of a, a channel strip thing using the, that circuit design. And uh, anyway, it's fabulous. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> right, so in the meantime, we have a jazz trio and just completely unhappy, completely unhappy with the recording process. Uh, and we had some experience with DSD because about 11 years ago, uh, we recorded a, a, a harpsichord record, actually. Um, I was a harpsichordist by uh, training. Uh, and uh, I, along with my teacher from when I was 13 years old, did a, a, a two harpsichord arrangement of, of uh, Bach's Art of the Fugue. Uh, and we wanted to be able to capture this in some way that was going to work. Uh, harpsichords are a nightmare to record. It's the worst instrument on earth to record because it is all these high partials and this, and this sharp transient attack on everything. And everybody who, I don't know, everybody, there are weird people in, in the world that like harpsichord recordings, but <laughs> there's something inherently wrong with them because uh, if you listen to virtually any harpsichord recording on CD. It is, it is like just check into Guantanamo, seriously. <laughs> um, and we ordered this uh, Korg MR1000, which they don't make anymore. Uh, <laughs> this is a thousand dollar machine and it came with some demo music on it. And I pull it out of the box and plug my headphones into it and turned it on and I just about passed out. I had never heard anything like this. It was a completely different experience than listening to music. And so I thought, all right, there's that. Um, of course, there's no multi-track solution for all the other work that we do. Um, and so we wound up buying a you know, metric halo eventually, and, which is a fine machine, it's fine. Uh, it's very ergonomic, it's the job done anyway. Uh, and we were struggling to try to figure out how to record our trio in a way that didn't make me want to jump off a train bridge. 
and uh, and we'd gone through all kinds of miking scenarios and all kinds of like, well, let's put everybody in different rooms. All right, yeah, get everybody back in the same room. All right, you know, let's kick that guy out of the room because he's the problem. And then we'll uh, dozens of different miking uh, schemes, dozens of different kinds of microphones, polar patterns, everything. Uh, and then we were at Summer Nam. Man, it's two and a half years ago, mm -hmm. right? And I said, hey, why don't we walk to the Tascam booth? And so we did. And uh, here's this guy who greets us. We know, well, what are you looking for? Well, we're interested in these. Well, it was the second month on the job, and I don't think he knew what they did. Uh, oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, they're converter thingies. Okay, fine. We, we got this. Uh, and we developed a relationship with him, and he's like, oh, I'll just, I'll mail you some. And so we got two of them together and were working out some different miking stuff. And then about two weeks before we started recording our record, I think I made some joke about, well, why don't we just use two Bloomline mics? And we mocked it up, but we had a pair of Probably with Doug's R88 and a pair, and a pair of, of Coles or, or, or yeah, it might have been your C12 clones or something like that. And we were astonished. It's like, wow, this actually, I don't understand why this works, but it, but it works. And uh, we called up AAA and said, hey, can you, can you send us a couple of R88s? And they, they did. And that is the only, this, this is what we've got here. This is the only mic scheme that we've used for this long. Uh, and we're still, I mean, we're in the middle of cutting a new record right now, and we're still using it, and it still works, uh, and it's fabulous. Um, reasons that's the case. Uh, and this is still, we're in the middle of this learning process, maybe the bottom half of the middle of this, this uh, learning process. And what we've been talking about, I mean, it's a constant narrative and it's us, the three of us and uh, other friends in the industry that we consult with and work with and do projects with and sessions for. There is this element of, and as engineers, we say, all right, well, how does this sound? Well, okay, well, it's peaky at 8K. I don't know, whatever. or this is, I'm hearing something in here, or this has got an artifact here or whatever. And we always deal in terms of how's this sound? I mean, you buy a Neumann microphone and it comes with a, a frequency response chart as if, what the hell is this thing going to tell? It doesn't tell you anything useful at all. Uh, oh, it's not, oh, what am I supposed to fix this little dip of an EQ? Forget it. Um, and we're starting to differentiate how things sound from how things feel. And and there's been a lot of sort of testing between high res PCM and, and DSD. And the thing that comes out is that, well, the engineer's like, oh, I can't hear it. I don't hear this. It sounds the same. The difference is, and I try this on my friends all the time, I put headphones on and record it uh, and play them one or the other. And if I play them high res PCM file, they listen and listen and listen. They're like, this sounds great. Mm -hmm. okay. When I put the D DSD recording on, they won't give me the headphones back. <laughs> and I don't have a scientific explanation for that, although I, I gotta say we've been reading a, a little bit more about it. And uh, uh, Ed Meitner uh, was the guy who designed the front end for the Sonoma system this 20 years ago. He was talking about this uh, in uh, uh, something I recently read uh, about how things are dealt with in PCM at, at or near the zero crossing. Because every time, and I always thought of it in terms of, oh, dynamics. Okay, so when the music gets soft, then you're losing bits, you're losing uh, resolution. But it hadn't occurred to me, it is every time any wave cycles crosses the zero crossing, you're getting this, I don't know what, 
dither or whatever, uh, whatever you want to call it. It's, it's junk. Um, these don't do that. And I think that is why it feels different. And we've done a lot of testing with uh, different recording techniques and stuff and, and then doing software file conversions. And what we found is if we capture music on, in the DSD, we can do successful file conversions into any format down at MP3 and an MP3 will sound great. Which is just unimaginable. Yes. <laughs> um, but uh, but we're, we're doing it consistently. Uh, so there's that. Uh, the other thing I, wanted, I, I would add to this whole thing is that we are musicians and we're jazz musicians so we don't make any money. <laughs> uh, but there is an emerging market of people that want DSD recordings. They want to listen to this stuff. And there's not a lot of product out there for them to listen to. Um, so as, as for us as a, a, a group, our goal is to sort of be on the cutting edge of, of being able to provide product for people to listen to. You know, I, I consider that we're the, sort of the benchmark at this point for a lot of this stuff. Well, okay, you're right, which is probably one last important thing is yeah. we also hooked up with Cookie Maranco at Blue Coast Music. Anybody know who she is? Yeah, so uh, we met her at a trade show and she said, my God, you guys are as crazy as I am. Um, <clears throat> and so she's put out a record. We did another project for her and we're doing another 50 projects for her. Uh, that are in the works currently uh, and uh, th that market is starved they are starving for DSD content there, there are a lot of naysayers are saying well I can't hear the difference yeah well you're testing PCM source stuff that has been converted into DSD and then saying, oh, well, it doesn't sound that much different. Yeah, right, but if you start by making DSD recordings, then they're vastly different by the time you disseminate them in DSD. Uh, now, all this is crap unless you can make money. And the thing about uh, Blue Coast is our, our deal with them, I mean, they're not a label, they're just, they're just you know. Dissemination. Yeah, they're just uh, putting it up for, you know, downloads it for sale. Our record sells for 50 bucks. We get $25 a copy of something that isn't physical. That's a nice deal. Um, and the economics start to make sense. And her clientele has become interested enough in us. Uh, that I, I was talking to her about a month ago, lamenting about, you know, I don't, we're not on a label. Do we need a label? Because we're having a hard time getting festivals booked and stuff at this point. And she handles all of the uh, DSD downloads for uh, Mac Avenue. Oh, all right, I wasn't going to say it. Oh. But, <laughs> I'm, you know, okay. a, a, a big little jazz label. Uh, and she said, well, you know, obviously I can set up a meeting for you, but, you know, we just finished the accounting and you guys have outsold their entire catalog in the last two quarters. Because everybody, know, you know, their clients know that we're recording this stuff from DSD at the get-go, and that's what they're interested in. So it's interesting. I mean, you know, it, it's easy to say, oh, well, this isn't vi this market isn't viable when when you're stomping on it all the time and you just want it to go away. And you know, I mean, I've read the the, the gear slips threads on on DSD and it's like ugh, there's a half dozen guys out there who've never seen these machines never worked with the stuff we were just you know beating us down with you know these nonsense things that they say about it um, so it's the same thing for for vinyl why why do people like vinyl does it sound better I mean come on it doesn't sound better but it does feel better it does um, and incidentally, uh, one of the engineers that we work with, uh, who does a lot of classical music, he's really a brilliant engineer in uh, Phoenix, uh, is into doing uh, DSD uh, capture and then 
going to uh, high res vinyl. It's like heavyweight discs and stuff. And that stuff is spectacular sounding. It's really, really a whole other level of. I, I could, he sent me, you know, a record. I couldn't believe how good this thing sounded. Totally three dimensional, not missing any dynamic response, not missing any frequency response. And my record player is like a 25 year old piece of junk. <laughs> and I'm still getting that out of it. So, anyway. All right. All right. Rubber meets the road? Yes. Okay. Let's do it. All right. Eric, before he sits down with the kit. While these guys are getting set up, just a couple other things I wanted to mention and, and just explain to you. Um, first of all, the, the two R88s, one here on the piano, one here in between the bass and drums. That's the way these guys record their own projects, so we basically duplicated what they do all the time. Now, ideally you do this with one microphone. The problem we run into is that a piano projects vertically. These two instruments are horizontal projection. So there's really no way one microphone accurately captures that. And because the piano is so important in this, we, we have to make sure that that's right. So capturing the piano, ideally, and then the other mic picks up the other two. And I should also mention that we did a session for a singer-songwriter recently where we did one R88. It was um, a, a drummer who also played guitar simultaneously. You can picture that. It was just bass, drum, and hi-hat, but it sounded pretty neat. A uh, singer who also played guitar, Joff on bass, and George on piano. And we did this simultaneously with one R88 going through one of our preamps to a DSD recorder. And because I wanted to make sure we had something good for the artist in case this didn't work, we also recorded a conventional way with multiple mics on everything. And that went to a radar recorder, which is a pretty decent PCM recording system. And we mixed that, which in the case of the uh, single mic, there's no mix involved at all, it's done. Uh, but we spent a couple of hours moving things around to get the, the balance and the stereo image correct. And there's a video available that goes through the process and you can see the setup, you can see uh, how we did it, and it has samples of both the single mic DSD recording and the multi-mic PCM recording. Now that's not a real good comparison because you're changing two variables there. Um, but we thought it was worth putting out anyway just because we figured that the, the people would be interested in that. The next experiment will be doing the same thing, single mic split to go to DSD and PCM simultaneously. But if you want to hear that, it's on the DW Fern um, YouTube channel. and. Um, also, if any of you are interested, I'd be glad to send you the high-res files. You can have either the DSD version, which you can, if you have a way to play it, I'll send you, you know, a high-res 24-bit uh, version of it, of each of those, so you can compare them for yourselves. Just keeping in mind, it's not really an accurate comparison because they're recorded with different techniques but it'll give you some idea. So with that, it's time for us to stop talking and make some music.